welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the car we're featuring today, my 1965 Jensen CV8. This is a car I've sort of been looking for for the last 10 or 12 years. They didn't really sell too many of them here in America. It's a fascinating automobile. It's a hybrid, but it's a hybrid in the different sense that we think of hybrid now. This comes with a 383 Chrysler V8, and that's the way it left the factory. The English are quite good at that. You know, they had a car called the Gordon Keeble, which was had a 327 Chevy in it, a four-seater car. This is basically, well, you know the Roadrunner, the cost of popular car from 1968 with the beep beep horn and all that? This is like a Roadrunner that went to college in Oxford, you know? Whereas the Roadrunner had drum brakes at the back and discs in the front. This has discs all the way around, tube chassis, fiberglass body, steel doors. You know, I was looking for a DB5 Aston Martin, and as much as I love those cars, they've gotten so crazy, so expensive. And this, to me, is an equivalent of that. It's certainly faster, more reliable, 330 horsepower, tons of torque from that big 383 V8. It has a uh, Chrysler Torque Flight automatic transmission. I think they built six with a stick, uh, but this one is the automatic, and it's right-hand drive. It's kind of fun, and that Sean Connery, James Bond, had one of these. He liked it better than the uh, DB5. He went and he bought one second-hand, or third-hand, if, if I'm not mistaken, being a Scotsman, quite thrifty, Sean. And uh, we talked about it once when he was on the Tonight Show with me as a guest. I said, hey, do you really have a CV8? Oh, I love the J. Love the car. You know, just went on and on. And I went, oh, okay, good. And I found this one locally in, in, in California. And I just I had to have it. Uh, I'm, uh, I just find it to be kind of the perfect combination of American horsepower with English uh, styling, English interior, you know, Connolly leather and the burl dashboard and all that kind of stuff. Uh, basically, the same interior you might find in a Jaguar or an Aston Martin. And uh, that's what I think makes it kind of cool. It's either the ugliest attractive car you've ever seen or the most attractive ugly car you've ever seen. This front end seems to divide people. Uh, I don't know why. I find it fascinating. This is the Mark III. This is the last version of this car. They only built a total of 500 of these in the whole, they ran from, I think, like 62 to 66. And they were handmade and quite expensive. Uh, this was right up there uh, with Aston and some of those other high-end brands when it was new. And it's extremely well made. The fiberglass is extremely well done. You wouldn't even know it was fiberglass. And it just has some odd features. Let me show you how you open the hood on this thing. It's kind of interesting. You have this door here. I'm not even sure if I have the right key. Let's see. Okay. So yeah, that door opens. Then you have this handle here. You pull that. You lift up. Pull the catch. And there you have that massive 383 V8. Totally stock. I've got the original air cleaner. This is a little less restrictive. Um, this has a little bigger radiator on it for California. Um, Oh, it's a fascinating automobile. A 12 volt system, of course. It's basically an American car under the skin. As I said, this is the last version of the Mark III, which I think is the prettiest version and uh, the best version in the sense that it has the most horsepower. Uh, the early models had a smaller V8, disc brakes. It's pretty clean under here. Uh, nothing too complicated. A little tricky to work on with this hood. You're probably better off to take the whole hood off if you were going to uh, do any real engine work on it. But the nice thing is, with American uh, a power plant and a powertrain, there's not a lot to go wrong. You know, these, these engines are big, massive, slow revving by European standards with a lot of torque at the bottom end. So they're tremendously under stress, especially in this application. Let's put this back down. And you gotta lock it here. And then you take the key, and you do that, and it, it just, I like the chrome bumpers, like the color. You know, when you're looking for one of these, you don't have a lot of choices. You just take the first one you find, and that's what I did, because 
I had heard about them and seen them for years. This is also the company that built the Jensen Interceptor. I never cared for that one as much as I like this. That one was just too big. It was too much like an American heart. That huge glass window in the back had the Chrysler 440. And it was, uh, it didn't appeal to me as much. This is smaller, lighter, uh, probably faster, and more unique looking, certainly. Let's, let's go around the back and take a look at the back of the car. And it's a proper saloon type car. You've got four seats with, that are, well, pretty comfortable actually. And you've got quite a bit of leg room in the back. It's not too bad. It's about the same as a Jag or one of those cars. You've got a nice full size trunk. As you see, this car was up at the Quail Lodge. The post-war sports cars, Jensen CV8 Mark III. There you go right there. Uh, and you can get a couple of suitcases in there if you have to. But this was just a high-speed touring car. It had a top speed of about 130 to 135 miles an hour, which in 1965 made it just about the fastest car you could get uh, in England at the time. And this engine was massive by English standards, you know, 383 cubic inches. You know, most of the big stuff was three and a half liters, maybe four liters at best. I haven't had this car for a long time. I only got it a few months ago, so I'm still learning about it and playing with it, but it's pretty, pretty reliable. And it's just a wonderful touring car. You got adjustable shock absorbers. Let me show you here in the interior. This car, we did not restore here at the shop. We were stored by uh, Joey and Joe DiBattista, two guys up in San Francisco. They did a wonderful job. They didn't do a mechanical restoration to it. They just did a cosmetic one. So we've got a few things to do to it, a few little things, but not much. Um, if you want to read more about these, this is the book to get. The Jensen V8, The Complete Story of American Powered Cars by Mark Dollery. Uh, but yeah, so I'm sort of learning on this one. I haven't had it that long, just a few months. And I've just been enjoying driving it and using it. Uh, usually the first thing we do when we get a car here is we tear it com completely apart and go through it. But this one's actually okay. Got a few things. Like this has select-a-ride shock absorbers. You turn it, you can adjust the stiffness and whatnot. Uh, that doesn't work. But then I'm told it never really did. For the price of, what, one-tenth the price of a DB5 Aston Martin, you can have something like this which uh, I think is probably more reliable and certainly faster than the equivalent uh, Aston Martin. And it has four seats and it's comfortable and it's quirky, you know, it's an interesting car. Uh, one of my favorite quirks is this right here. Let me show you. You open the fuel door, you've got an electric switch right here. There you go. And the cool thing is there's no gas cap per se. You just have the gas door which also serves as the cap. You see, you got this here. This goes over the opening and seals it tight, so you don't have to take a cap on and off or put it on the paint. So that's kind of cool, one of those nice little features. So there's a lot of little interesting design features on this car that I find uh, fascinating. You know, every time I look at it, I see something I didn't notice before. But come on, let's take it for a ride. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. I guess the first thing we do is go with the various gauges in the car. Here's you got your Becker Grand Prix radio. Those are very cool. Your glove box is right here. Rear demist, fan, air, ammeter, clock, fuel gauge, of course. Your wipers, your panel lights, your headlights, and other, uh, these are both air vents right here. Then you have your speedometer, goes to 160. Your oil, uh, water temperature, tachometer. This has a torque flight transmission, as I said, rather unusual pattern. There's no park on it. You have reverse, neutral, drive, one and two. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that. I guess you use the emergency brake when you park. You can shift it manually if you want, like this, and then, you know, which is quite good. It just has torque I don't think you would find in almost any other 
British car of the period, especially one that didn't have a, an American engine like this. What's really unusual, if you can notice, is the way these seat belts attach. You've got a rod that runs from here down to the floor and it goes across your chest this way. I'm not sure how effective that is. Oh, I forgot the map light right there. There you go. Then of course, down here, you have your selector air, or selector ride rather. You turn that, it says like hard, soft. I, it, that doesn't work. And then you have various air vents here and there. You have your cigarette lighter or your power output as we call it now. Horn is right here, wood rim steering wheel. Test of the period uh, remarked how wide these were inside at speed that you introduce the aerodynamics of the car. And it is pretty quiet when you're going down the road. Uh, you can have a conversation, you can listen to the radio without a lot of wind noise. The fit and finish of the doors and everything is actually very, very good. And the fiberglass is really high class, high quality fiberglass, you know. A lot of times with fiberglass cars, especially ones this old, you see a lot of cracks and crinkles in the fiberglass, you know, and the paint starting to crack. Not with this one. You know, in period, they describe this as a four-seater sports car, which I, I think it really is. I mean, it, it handles quite nicely, but you've got a lot of extra room. It's quite a practical car. If you were a wealthy businessman in 1965, this is a pretty cool vehicle. Pretty cool vehicle now. I like this era of the mid 60s. There's just so much, there was just so much cool stuff around. The Lamborghini Miura had just come out. In 65 and 66, as I've said before, probably on this website, it's my favorite year for style. 1932 and 1966. 1932, because the car was here to stay by that point, and they were building wild, outrageous cars with 12 and 16 cylinders. And 1966 is one of my favorites because it's the last year, at least in America, where you could have just style without any worrying about meeting government regulations or headlight height or bumpers or crash impact. You could just style the wildest car you could and put it on the road. And it was a fascinating time. Now, obviously, designers and stylists have to meet all sorts of rules and regulations. You couldn't make a Lamborghini mirror today, that's for sure. Headlights are too low, no bumpers, no crash protection. No, nothing, just pure unbridled style. I think one of the reasons there weren't more of these hybrids in Europe and England was that in Europe, and probably in England, they tax you by the size of the engine, you know? Uh, something at six or eight liters, which would be unheard of uh, normally, which is our normal rather than America, would be crazy, especially in Italy. I know Italy and France, anything over 2.7 liters, it's huge tax, like double the tax. So having something like this or a Fassel Vega or any of those cars that had American V8s, I think the taxes would be just so oppressive as to be crazy. I love the fact this has gauges instead of idiot lights for oil and temperature and air meters. You know, you don't just idiot lights, they call them that because you're an idiot. The light comes on, oh, I, now I know everything's broken. You can't do anything about it. These with a gauge get some sense of where you are, if it's not putting out what it's supposed to or whatever. A bunch of kids just yelled at my car. See, they don't know what it is, but they know it's something unusual. The Jensen name is really the name of two brothers, uh, Alan and Richard Jensen. They sort of started the company and kept it going. It's a, one of those classically British small concerns, you know? I always like British car builders, you know? I mean, building 500 of these, 500 of these in four years, that was a huge amount of cars, you know? It's not like America, we turn out 500 every day. You know, it's it's sort of hand built and a lot of hand craftsmanship, and and they were quite successful for a long period of time until about uh, I think it started to go downhill in the 70s. And by the 80s, I think it was pretty much over. People have tried to bring back the Jensen name, 
In fact, there was a company in England redoing the old interceptors, you know? The one with the big glass window. And I'm not quite sure how that worked out. And the nice thing about this car is English cars, especially of this period, had a reputation for dodgy electrics and, and leaking oil and things like that. But of course, being an American powertrain, uh, that's not the case, at least not with this one. I really haven't done anything to it. This is the first car I've bought in a long time that we just haven't had to totally go through and tear down or rebuild. There are a few things. I think it tends to run a little warm on hot days, so we're gonna figure that out. I think maybe the radiator might be a little too big or too thick and the air is not getting through the core, but I, I don't know just yet, so that's something we'll find out. But I just wanted to get up here and show it to you because I, I think it's really cool looking. I'm anxious to read the comment section to see what people think. Although it's dark out, let's, uh, there's the headlights on. There's your high and low beam right there. As you figured out by now, I really enjoy driving this thing. It's so distinctly different from a lot of the other cars I have. This is a true sort of GT Grand Touring car. And if you're just taking a Sunday drive somewhere, although very fairly quickly. It's, it's a nice vehicle to use. As I said, I love the smell of the interior. I love the look of the dashboard. I love the wood. I love this whole English uh, coach-built look with American mechanicals. So anyway, this might not have been as in-depth as a lot of the cars we do because I haven't had it that long. I just had it a month or two, but I was anxious to show it to you and get your opinion and see what you think. Uh, yeah, let me know. Let me know in the comment section. I think they're kind of cool. Uh, and I'd be curious to hear how many are in America. I'd be real curious to hear that. Because I, I really haven't seen too many here. So that's about it. Listen, thanks for checking this out. I hope you enjoy these different cars we show every week. We try to have unusual things that most people aren't familiar with. And, uh, and that's about it. So I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for checking it out. Mm-hmm. <laughs>